But for most people, practicing lifts more often just improves their skill faster. Yeah. Just the bottom line. like You just get better at it. You do. Like if you did 10 sets of, of, uh, of squats in one day or you did 10 sets over three days, uh, even though you're doing the same amount of, of sets, you're, you're probably going to get better at squats faster by practicing it more frequently, even though the volume is the same. And that skill acquisition from strength training is so valuable, uh, especially for most people. Boom! Here's the giveaway. It's our newest program, Map Symmetry. I'm going to give away Map Symmetry for free to only one of you. This is how you can do it, though. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section, and you'll get free access to the brand new Maps Symmetry program, very popular program. Also, big sale, okay, because it's June. Everybody's trying to get lean. It's summertime. You want to look good. So here's the sale. We have a shredded summer bundle, which is multiple programs, Maps Aesthetic, Maps Hit, Maps Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. You got diet and workout all covered. That's a bundle, meaning it's already discounted, but we took an additional 50% off. So we got that, and we also have Maps Hit by itself 50% off. So if you just want to try one program, see what uh, all the talk is about, why everybody loves Maps programs, Maps Hit by itself also 50% off. Here's how you can get the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code June50 for that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Look, here's the truth. For most of you, the ideal frequency you should train each body part when all other things are equal and controlled for is about three days a week. For most of you, training your body parts three days a week is ideal for strength gains, muscle gains, and for improving exercise technique. You know, yeah. this is like a hotly contested, mm. consistently contested debate that we by who yeah. the no days off people. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. What are we talking about no, here? they like body part splits, so it's not really yeah. isn't it? And well, no, the, no, the, re the research the research points to two to three times, right? Two I mean, to four, two to four. Is yeah, what you'll see in the research that it'll it'll point to two to four, and some say two is a little better. Some say maybe four in some ways. And it kind of lands in the three range. Mm. Um, and when it come, you mentioned body part splits, and you can break up the body in a lot of different ways and still achieve each body part getting hit, hit three days a week. Right? That's hard, though. I think it's more realistic, too, when you do splits. Yeah, like two days a week, right? Yeah. Yeah, because like it's typically like upper, lower right. legs or something like that. Right, and right. Repeat. And if you split even less than that down to one or two body parts, it's yeah. almost impossible to go two or three times, yeah. more than two times. Yes, but the data is pretty clear that definitely more than one. And, and now you got to consider that they're controlling for volume uh, here, too. So it doesn't mean if you hit a body part three days a week that you're doing triple the volume. We have to control everything, meaning if you did, uh, you know, let's say, 25 sets for back, is it more effective to do it all in one workout in well, two workouts out. Yeah. or three workouts or maybe four, right? And um, in, in our experience, three is ideal. And mainly for this, because I know there's studies that show that two and three are pretty similar. Although I've, I have seen some studies that, that point that strength gains might be a little better mm -hmm. with more frequency. I like hitting the body parts three days a week for a few different reasons. One, um, people tend to do the more, most effective exercises more often when that happens. Like if I do mm -hmm. 12 sets in one workout um, for legs, let's say, I'll do squats, you know, once. If I do 12 sets spread out over three workouts, I'm more likely to squat three times, right? Because as I'm doing my workout all in one, I start to get fatigued. Now I'm going to move right. the leg extensions. And you got to other... do the machines because you're exhausted, fatigued, but you still want the volume. So if you can spread it out throughout the week, yep. like you usually tend to pick uh, the most effective compound lifts yes, for yes. the most part. The other reason why I like it is uh, especially for, maybe this doesn't necessarily apply to super advanced lifters, but for most people, practicing lifts more often just improves their skill faster. Yeah. Just the bottom line. like You just get better at it. You do. Like if you did 10 sets of, of, uh, of squats in one day or you did 10 sets over three days, uh, even though you're doing the same amount of, of sets, you're, you're probably going to get better at squats faster by practicing it more frequently, even though the volume is the same. And that skill acquisition from strength training is so valuable. Uh, especially for most people, maybe not the super advanced who've mm -hmm. been working out for a while and they've really got the skills of lots of lifts, but most people don't fall into that category. Most people, you know, are, are, haven't been training more consistently for longer than a year or two, and that consistent practice, that frequent practice, makes a big difference. Yeah, I just love the cadence of the three 
uh, three workouts per week with the rest days kind of in between. Oh, you like the full body? Yeah, the full Same body. Here. Yeah, that's I just prefer. I just how I can accomplish all the body parts, but then uh, feel like I don't really run into that fatigue, and I feel like the most energetic going into uh, the following day after. I mean, I like it for the reasons too that you, in, the inevitable happens. You miss one. Yeah, that's so it. what. You know, you have a three day a week routine that is full body where you're hitting every muscle group three times a week and you had a busy week or like I just came off of getting sick. So what you missed, you know, and I missed, you know, four or five days of that week of training anything, but at least I got a single full body workout in that week. And so I think that's one of my favorite things about switching from a body part split to a more full body type of training routine is that, you know, there's this, there's this less pressure to like, oh, I got to hit the gym because I'm going to miss this body part. Or when I do miss or get sick and then I come back going like, oh, what was it I did last? I forgot. Mm. Like what muscle group am I on? And the natural thing is always, to, I'll just do the one I like to do, yeah, you know, which yeah. is, I think everybody does. Chest. But I want, <clears throat> I want to go back to something you said because I remember when I first read that study and um, I made a mistake that I think a lot of uh, people do when they decide where they hear like, oh, the frequency thing is so mm. important. Um is I start, and I, I know you said it, but I think people just, we still fall into that same trap of thinking more is better, mm -hmm. you know? And that is if I trained, you know, because for me, for me, uh, when I was doing body part splits, it was typically 12 to 15 sets per muscle group, mm -hmm. okay, uh, is what I did. And I hammered it, right, for that and like one, one workout. Yeah, right. right. And so what I ended up doing was, oh, frequency is two to three times a week for optimal muscle gaining. So what I tried to do was, you know, two more work at one to two more workouts that mirrored that one that I was currently doing for versus going, oh, I'm going to take the work I was doing in that one workout and just divide it over two or three yes. days because uh, it didn't register for me. I thought, oh, OK, well, now I understand frequency is important. So I'm going to try and do at least what I'm doing on this day or more on another day or two days later. And no, now you just triple the volume. Yeah. Way too much. And just way too much. No, this is all things being con controlled for, but I'll go back to what I said about exercise selection. Like, let's say, let's say you're going to work your shoulders. Okay. And it's 15 sets in today's workout. I'm doing a typical body part split. So I'm not hitting my body part, my shoulders three times this week. I'm going to hit it once. So I'm going to do 15 sets in one workout. Probably three or four sets will be some kind of an overhead press. Most workouts, justifiably, because it's a good way to program, is to start your workout with a compound lift, the heavy one, the one that, you know, it's kind of the biggest bang for your buck. And then each successive exercise starts to move down towards more isolation type movements, more getting a pump, what bodybuilders would call finishers, because you're not going to do 15 sets of overhead presses in one workout for the most part. Super exhausting. <laughs> However, let's say I did shoulders three days in the week, five sets each day, right? Wow. So it's still 15 sets. I'm starting out each workout and I'm more likely to do more of these big gross motor movement, these kind of this overhead press. I'm probably going to overhead press at least two of those workouts, if not all of them, um, for a majority of the sets and maybe throw in some isolation stuff for one or two sets at the end of the workout, right? So you end up doing these more effective exercises. You practice these exercises that require more skill so you get more out of them. Now, what this also requires is how to modulate intensity, which this is another reason why I love mm -hmm. training this way is it really teaches you how to modulate the intensity appropriately, which is a very valuable skill because when you're working a body part once mm -hmm. and you're done for the week for that body part, it's like hard or nothing. I'm not going right. to be able to do this body part again until next Monday. You leave it all there. Right. But if it's shoulders, you know, three days a week, yeah. um, I mean, Monday might be hard. Wednesday comes around, um, you know, I'm a little sore from Monday. Let me go a little easier, um, get more of a pump. And then Friday comes around, oh, I feel good again. I'll go hard again type of deal. So the skills you learn from training this way are also better. And then I'm going to make this argument, and there's no evidence to support this. this. is my own theory. But, you know, when you send a muscle building signal through exercise, most of it is, um, I guess you could use, the, to, for lack of a better term, it's localized. In other words, if I work out my biceps, most of the muscle building signal goes to the bicep, right? But there is a systemic muscle building effect. And there's studies that show this. For example, if I have a broken left arm, and I train my right arm, I will actually prevent as much muscle loss from a left arm that could happen if I never worked out my right arm. So my left arm's not doing anything, but because I'm training my right arm, 
I actually lose less muscle. And they've done studies on this, and it's they show this with e- either limb, the the right arm, left arm, left leg, right leg, back to chest, whatever. If you have an injury, training the rest of your body actually sends this kind of systemic muscle building signal, which makes mm-hmm. evolutionary sense. It would make no sense for your body to have all be local and zero systemic effects. Well, and so, what do we attribute yeah. that to? Mostly CNS, the signaling, yeah. because you're getting a, a louder, stronger signal. The CNS is being trained, and so it being trained and becoming more efficient or stronger then still contributes to well, other parts of the body. Well, it's communicating what the environment consists of. There you go. That's right? what so saying. it's like, yeah, it's like how your body needs to be able to overcome this stress, this force. Uh, so it just will... I, I'm guessing like this is like it, it'll prioritize uh, building muscle in certain areas of your body to withstand, even though you're probably just focusing on one side versus the other, um, you know, systemically your whole body needs to respond. Yeah. Because think about from an evolutionary standpoint, when in nature <clears throat> would you just need your biceps to be strong or just need your quads, right? It's probably whatever movement you're doing. Okay. Majority of the gains will go to the quads, but we also need to bolster the rest of the body a little bit. So you get this kind of carryover effect. It's not huge, but it's still there. So I think full body workouts, uh, because that's the more common way to do, you hit the body uh, three times in terms of, you know, body part frequency. I feel like a full body workout sends a louder general muscle building signal than dividing up uh, the body. Now, is there there any theory or is there a study to prove like, okay, I would assume to the point you're making right now that, okay, if I, if I just did left arm bicep curls, I do get a little bit of benefit to my right side, obviously not as much as localized, but I get some benefit of it. Now I would think that doing, you know, barbell back squats sends a a louder systemic signal than a left arm bicep curl does. Do we have research to show that i mean in my experience it just tells me that like man i there's been times when all i was really doing was squatting yet i felt my shoulders develop a little bit my back still developed a little bit my you know core midsection developed a little bit like there definitely is something about the the value that you're getting from just like a a heavy barbell back squat by itself yeah well in comparison to a a single arm well i mean holding the barbell on your back uh there's thoracic uh spine Stability. There's your low back stability. There's Traps, core stability. Rhomboids. Your calves. Core, your, yeah, calves. everything's for a big exercise like that. So yeah, there's there's definitely going to be some carryover. I mean, doing a leg press is not going to build the same low back and core stability that um, a squat would, for example. Definitely not thoracic. You're not holding anything on your back. Yeah. So these movements can be practiced more frequently when the training's done that way. And again, I think that the signal, the general muscle building signal, is just louder. Yeah. Because you're doing the whole body. There's more body. demand, right? There's more muscle involvement. There's more uh, muscle tension involved isometrically to to maintain posture, maintain mm-hmm. position make, through the mechanics. So, I mean, there's a multitude of factors in there, I'm sure. I mean, it's you're not going to need to produce as much force uh, throughout your body to just do a bicep curl versus a back squat. Yeah. And often the advice that we get or we read is like, in this ideal context, in this ideal situation, right? But the reality is the average person typically has a normal life, kind of busy, wants to maximize the time that they're spending in the gym, probably should practice the skill of lifting because their their skill on some of these compound lifts isn't like perfect. Um, they're probably going to miss over the course of a year, you know, 10 workouts or more, you know. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you gave me 100 people, uh, everyday regular people who are somewhat serious about their fitness, want to build muscle, build strength, and you said, what general – split would probably work what best for the majority of them. I'd be like full body two, three days a week. Yeah. That'll outperform all the other stuff because of all the other factors that we're talking about. So especially over the course of, you know, a year, two years, when you talk about totally, like long-term. I'm not interested in short-term success. I know you guys aren't either. Every, everything yeah. we tend to hear in the fitness space is about short-term. Well, success. that's, be, that's part of the problem though, is all the studies are done that way. Yeah. Every yeah. study is done in a six. I mean, there's very rarely do you run across a study that they did over a year or whatever like that. Most studies are six, 12 weeks, you know, maybe tops. Yeah, especially and, when it comes with training. Yeah, yeah. and so then we, we you, you know, in the fitness space, we tend to take, we'll take a piece of information from a study like that and then build this huge argument around why you should train this way and why should that. It's like, well, there's so many other factors. And when you're only talking about six weeks, like, okay, yeah, in a very controlled environment, 
that makes sense or that is is close to because right now that's part of the argument too right with a body part split versus the full body routine like in a six week controlled study they, they they're not you're, we're not talking about a massive difference you're not talking about a huge difference for someone like that but over the course of six months eight months a year two years of training it that shit there, will add there up. was a poll that I, I i wish i could find it and hopefully i do by the time this airs but i found a poll where they asked some of the top strength and conditioning coaches and trainers and and these are well-known names and all i mean all of them i think said full body three days a week is probably the most effective for about 80 percent. well and that's experience talking yep that's what that is that's yep. not someone referencing a study well this study says this and shows yep. this therefore this that's you're talking about probably coaches that have been doing this for decades and can say, well, you know, I, I, which you've also read the studies too, yeah. but then also have paid attention to behaviors and consistency around training and said, yeah, you know, they may be close in a six week study, but, and, and that's why I keep bringing up the, my favorite part about it is the inevitable always happens. I just came off of being sick. Wasn't that long ago we're traveling. We're getting ready to travel in another month again. Mm -hmm. So it's like rarely ever, I mean, in that small window of my life when I was so heavily focused on competing did i never miss workouts you know along those lines too i do want to mention that uh, oftentimes we look at the top athletes of a particular category and we use them as the example of how most people should yeah. train so wrong yeah. bodybuilders uh are very different from mo from 99.9% .9 of people watching this or listening to this you're so different from a bodybuilder it's not even funny it's as di you are so you're the distance. But why between, do we think that just by lifting weights we could end up looking like that? You, you couldn't. And look, <laughs> yeah. it, the difference between the distance between ninety nine point nine percent of people watching this and a pro bodybuilder is the same distance as them from Stephen Hawking's or Elon Musk or you know LeBron James. Okay, that's the distance. So if I look at LeBron James and I'm like, hey, well, it works for him. It ain't probably ain't gonna work for me. Pro bodybuilders. Prop, there's a lot of factors that make them so genetically gifted when it comes to building muscle. Forget the drugs that they take. They're just so gifted at building muscle naturally that they probably lift weights and that muscle building signal for them lasts 10 times as long as it does for the average well, person. Well, and back to your, your sport analogy, to their, it's not just the genetic component. It's also their <sighs> desire to be the best at their sport You know that they're competing at. So they're their discipline level is so oh, that's all they do. Yeah. I mean, and, and I that during that time of my life, like, okay, yeah, I didn't miss workouts and yeah, I did travel and do some things, but I mean, my life was so centered around dieting and training because it was, I was competing that I, where when I'm, normal me would have been like, Oh, I'm taking the day off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying I'm traveling. I'm gonna be with my family. I'm going to relax. I'm not going to carry Tupperware around to this or make some weird order like this. But when you're normal people that want to be healthy and fit, and I like to look good and feel good and all those same things, but it's not as much of a priority. And I just don't think that it's, so it's a, they're a terrible example for us to pull from and say, this guy does this or that guy does this. Therefore, this is what I should do. It's just like, no, you're, yeah. you're nothing like Plus, them. when you, again, back to the genetics, like when you see someone like this, they'll get big muscles from running long distance. Like literally, <laughs> like they're so gifted at building muscle. It's really, it's not a good idea to extrapolate what works for them and kind of apply it to yourself. Yeah, Just, that's the worst is like when uh, you, you get at one of those athletes that's like an extreme endurance per, and they're jacked and you're like, and then your client tries to like ask you what they're doing and like, you're like, like don't do that. It's, it's not, it doesn't make sense. You know, this guy's an anomaly, <laughs> yeah, so dude. let's move on. I know. Yeah. Funny. Anyway, uh, I got to tell you guys some funny stuff. So this, uh, this past weekend, we had the family over for dinner. So we had all my parents and my brother and my sister and <coughs> they brought their kids and i don't know if i have i told you guys about italian time have i explained that to you guys italian, italian time no. <laughs> is uh, that uh, you mean as far as like being late i mean okay like i know this but i always I, you know i kind of give them the benefit of the doubt so i'll tell them is that like the first thing in the morning where everybody yells at each other no that's okay. <laughs> because i've been to some italian families so it's, it's we're not fun. yelling it's we're fun just, we're just talking we're right talking. Ah! i i give them a time and it's all that doesn't matter. They they will the first person will always show up a minimum of forty five minutes late. And that and when they show up, this is the funny part. They'll show, I say hey, everybody four o'clock. Okay, I got food coming. <laughs> Please show up at four o'clock. The first person to show up is my parents, and I think there was like four forty five. And and I'm like, Ma, we you late? I told you guys to be. What do you mean? Like we're on time? It's it's only four forty five. Like they think they're on time because they're not. Because you're in that late. window of four. 
yeah. to the point where we're going to start lying. Like, yeah. what time's the party yeah. start? Three o'clock. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tell them. And then, of course, I'm sure someone will finally show up on time and piss me off if I did something like that. I feel like that's wife time, too. I, I do that. I've been doing that with Katrina for years, man. What do you mean? Yeah, just tell. I always lie to her about what time we have to be somewhere. Oh, I don't know. Really? I, She's I, not, always, is she not punctual? She, I mean, if she if she has to be somewhere meeting business wise, that's different, yeah. right? But when it comes to us, like, or if we're we're going to a friend's house, or and you know how I am about packing up and going yeah. somewhere, right? Oh so my God. like, I'm like annoying. I'm super militant <laughs> about that, right? I want to be like it's like nine a.m. He's like, we got to yeah, be there at one. Yeah. I want to be ready. Five minutes book. early is late to me, right? <laughs> so that's how I just I run. I definitely run like that. So could you imagine if she's even slightly on the other? And then of course you guys marry each other. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I learned early on, so I just when if it's something that I I'm organizing and I want us to be somewhere at a certain time, I just, I lie. I just well, say we have to be there an hour before. And so- That's the difference. If I want to be somewhere, I'm super punctual. If I don't want to be somewhere, I'm like, we're going to be fashionably late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to be 20 to 40 minutes late. Oh, dude. Yeah. My family yeah. is consistent. And my mom, I love her, so, but she used to say, oh, I have four kids. That's why it's so hard to be on time. And that was like a total valid reason. Well, yeah, yeah four kids. You got a man. I'm like, mom, it's you and dad. Yeah. You literally have nothing to do today aside from being here at four <laughs> o'clock. You know why? She's just so accustomed to using that excuse because it is the best excuse. Of course. Yeah. One of my favorite things about having a kid is that excuse. Oh, yeah. And you get to leave parties early yeah, too. Yeah, automatic This party out. sucks. Automatic baby's, out. Baby's tired. And you don't feel <laughs> bad. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I would love I to know. do that, but you know, we got to take my son here. Well, there's, oh, another, oh, well, <laughs> there's another thing that, that my family does, and I think in my cult, just in our culture in particular does this, which is the estimating the right amount of food. Oh. I not the hand signals, yeah. just <laughs> a little racist there. Yeah. My uh, the, the the food estimates are always ridiculous. So oh, it's it's always too much food, bro. Right? So I ordered a bunch of food, right? So we had all this chicken and food, and it gets there, and you know my parents are there. We're waiting for my brother, and my sister, of course, and my 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 dad's like, is, is there more coming? I'm like, no. This is we have. I think we had uh, 10, 10 total people. I'm like, I got enough food. For 14 people. And he looks at that and he goes, um, no. So he goes, you know, just six of us could eat all this. And I'm like starting to question myself. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Shit, did I you eat order? this? Yeah. My mom's like, yeah, you should probably yeah. order some more. So I'm like, are you sure? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we had seven people the other day and we ate twice. So I'm like, damn. So I'm like, I'm, I'm ordering more food. I'm like, how much more should I order? Like, you know, get like, get like twice as much, get at least twice as much <laughs> and then we'll probably be okay. I so think like, this is not just an Italian thing. This is a Mexican thing too. Cause dude, this is Katrina's, you guys do the same Katrina's thing? family's like this. Dude. I like, I come over and there's like hell of food and I'm like, who's all coming? Oh, this is everybody. Yeah. I'm like, there's six of us. Dude. <laughs> we think we're going to feed like 30 people. I ordered yeah. twice as much. It's of course. the opposite though. You're, that's true. The first amount was enough. Yeah, dude. And the food was sitting there afterwards. I'm looking at I've my parents. I've been to like, parties. Like my family's thrown and I'll throw them under the bus. Like, and it's like, I go to eat because I'm like, you know, socializing, doing the thing. And I go and there's like nothing left, dude. And I'm like, what? This isn't even a party anymore, <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm leave. I think that's why yeah. I, don't, I don't complain, right? Because I'm with you, Justin. That's like super annoying. It is. You go somewhere don't to be go. that party. Yeah. We've you never. Keep it stoked. Yeah. Never run out of food. Yeah. Ever. There's never been a, I believe a, that. a food item where I'm like, oh, is there? Oh, there's none left. Never. Yeah. Never that nope, way. There's a backup bowl in the refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> there's always <laughs> way more. We always have potatoes somewhere in my family. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, dude. So I was just, it was just funny. I was sitting there. I was just talking with Jessica about it. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I can't. We're going to have to lie. Yeah. So the, the late thing, isn't that there's some kind of tie there with like cortisol and like uh, in terms of like people continuously yeah. just being late for, yeah. for events and late for They like meetings. the rush. Well, yeah, I th kind of that a, would be, that's true for people who relate to everything. Yeah. My, my, I mean, look, my brother's successful in his work. I know he's on time to work. My mom has, she's always on time for her job, all that stuff. I think it's just the expectations where it's to the point if you show up on time, it's almost rude. Like, oh, no, no, you know, you show up on time, they're still going to be getting the house ready and everything. So we got to wait at least an hour. Like, that's how it's gotten. It's gotten to that uh, point. Yeah. So I'm like, because we'll show up on time sometimes to a party. We'll, oh, five minutes late. And, I'll, and, you know, we'll be like rushing. And then we'll walk in and like, yeah. there's no one there. And I'm like, yeah. of course, we're yeah. the first ones here, you know? Well, speaking of Mexican food, Adam, uh, <laughs> I- uh, More racist jokes. Here's the thing. Say. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was funny because like uh, Ethan was able to stay at one of his friend's house and like uh, stay overnight and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, how'd it go? And like, you know, and he was kind of describing the whole night they went to like play mini golf, whatever. They came back to, to eat dinner and he was like, yeah. And then, and then his mom was going to have, make some Mexican food and like- and he was like, I'm like, well, how was it? Is it good? He's like, well, you know, I was a little bit 
um, worried about how it was going to, cause, okay. So basically she was like, Hey kids, you guys want some quesadillas and some <laughs> salsa? And he's like, he's like, I wasn't very confident that the quality was going to be there, Dad. And I was like, I get that, right? Like some chimichangas, you know? like uh, like not real authentic. Yeah. Let's just say, you guys yeah. want some uh, some macaroni tacos? Yeah, <laughs> I was dying because I was like, oh yeah, I would probably be a little yeah. worried too. Uh, uh, hey uh, son, you, you you finish your bologna enchiladas, please. Yeah, <laughs> finish that up, buddy. Yeah, I know. I, it's like when I see people making. I'm going to piss people off, but I see people making lasagna and I'm like, lasagna. What are you putting cheddar in there? Like, what are you oh. putting in your lasagna? That's not lasagna. <laughs> Don't yeah. call it that. It's like pineapple on pizza. Here's I'm going to piss everybody off. Uh, Don't do that. That's the worst thing ever. Pi- uh, what the hell's pineapple on pizza? I'm with you on that. Like that's like, that. now did you guys, so no one, did you guys barbecue? It's, it was a Memorial weekend. No one barbecued. Did you barbecue Doug? I know you did. I did. Yeah. I smoked too. You, I, uh, I feel like that's like, you're supposed went to, to a that you're supposed to now, smoke did the, on. Did huh? the wind blow the thing oh, out again? Bro, listen to this crap. Cause it was windy. So yeah, and it's always really windy at my house. So I'm 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 grilling or smoking this weekend, and I did the the. It's not a butcher box commercial, but I did their ribs. And I tell you what, dude, like it's the heritage pork. It there I it I have several times now tried other great ribs from people recommending it, and I don't I don't I have yet to cook anything as good as the butcher box heritage ribs. pork tastes better. Yeah, it's just fact. Anyways, again, it's not a commercial, so it's not today's not the day to talk about that really. But I'm out there and. Uh, so it's so windy at my place. I was telling Douglas the other day, my only frustration with the smoker is it's a very, it's like a very small flame in there that, that, that heats up the whole thing. And it's a real slow cook. Right. And it gets so windy at my place that it'll blow the flame out. And what sucks is it's a slow cook. So a lot of times I'll get everything already. It's a four hour, six hour ordeal. I get it on there. Everything's fine outside. It's not that windy. And then I'm like, you know, watching basketball or doing stuff in the house. And then I go out there and my shit's been blown out and meat's been sitting in there cold for an hour. Just fucks the whole thing up. So I had to like, so I like move my other grill to block some wind and moving furniture on my, I have like a California room and moving all this furniture and, I took my this uh, this wicker wicker and glass table and I set it up on my uh, other table that was out there and I'm grilling and Katrina comes out there and she's like, "Are you gonna leave that there?" And I'm like, "No, I was just moving it because I had to get some room to block the wind, whatever." Right? So she comes in and I'm like, "Of course I'm not gonna leave it there." So I finish finish grilling after the ribs turn out phenomenal, and uh, it's later on that night. And uh, after the grill is cooled down to go put the covers on, and I'm like looking out and it's like now it's getting really windy. And I'm like, "Oh, you know what?" I look out the slider and I'm like. I need to go put those those covers on before they blow blow out out to my neighbors or something like that because it's getting that windy, and I and I'm I, I look and I'm like I should do that right now and then I'm looking at it's the Celtics and Miami game still going and the and Miami's making a run they're coming back and it's like fourth quarter I'm like I'll I'll get to it in just a minute I'll sit down so I sit down literally like five minutes later I hear this boosh and I went oh fuck right get up I walk out there. And the wind picked up a wicker and glass table and flipped it and then exploded on the oh, ground. Yeah. Like the shitty part about this and why my back is all tweaked from freaking shoveling. That's why you're so taking, sore right now. That's my, why you're my back is so sore right now. Because <laughs> you had to do some manual labor. Bro, it's been years, dude. So, <laughs> hey, well, and and I did it at like a level that I, because it's my son, right? Okay, so, oh, yeah. so first of all, this glass You don't is want any of that near him. Shattered. Yeah. Like, I mean, the biggest piece is like this big. Oh, it's because they make it safety glass. Yes. Yeah, so it ex- so it just explodes. It exploded. Yeah, it turns into freaking and it explodes dust, or- into my son's sand pit. Uh, yeah, dude. So I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I spent the whole night first starting out like picking it off uh, with my my fingers. That's brutal, impossible. Yeah, and then realized I'm gonna be here for weeks trying to do this. So then I just said, okay, I'm just gonna fucking shovel. You know, I'm gonna dig. Basically, I'm gonna. I basically made a line of. I looked to see how far it shattered out, which was probably a. I don't know five feet by you know eight feet long like area and then just said i'm just gonna throw away all the dirt all the sand that's in that in that area so i was like i mean i shoveled like a whole trash can worth of sand out 
it was just a lot. It was hours of shoveling. You know what? <laughs> that you, rotational movement. <laughs> oh, bro, that's oh, repetitive. Yeah. You don't do it often on the gonna, same side too. Oh, yeah. it's, you know? uh, I remember that because I was digging up my um, septic tank. I remember like, when that dude, happened, dude. And I had to end up getting like a pickaxe because the, the ground got really hard, and it was like, dude, what am I doing? <laughs> I was so sore in oh, my whole bro. body, yeah. dude. I didn't. You know what? I just remembered. So you got, you know how I used to go help my dad in the summers when he would, uh, you know, he'd have me come work with him. And a lot of what, what I would do is mix uh, cement. So he would make the mud and I go mix it. And, and the mud is made with sand. Sand is one of the main ingredients. We actually had, I don't remember what it was that broke in the sand, but we go buy all the sand, right? And we're going to do a job. I don't remember what it was. Something in the van toppled over and glass broke in the sand. And we, we don't have time to go back and buy more. We got to do this job. So what we did, and this was actually kind of effective. What we did is we got a big, um, uh, like not great, but almost like a screen, like screen, like you get on a screen door, yeah. but just a little bit bigger. We laid it out. We got two by fours on each side. So it was like a big thing. And then I, I would put a shovel of sand over it and I'd shake so it. So I was going to mining and I'd I zipped it out and it actually worked. For so I was going to do something yeah. like that. Here's the shitty part about my house. Do you guys, you guys remember what's in my backyard? I have those black wood chips. So I've got all of these. So not only do I have this this glass in my sand, but I also have the all these wood chips because I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll shake yeah. it all out. But then what would have been there would have been all the wood chips and that yeah. it wouldn't have sifted. The wood chips won't sift through the sand. Then you have to go. Then you have to throw the wood chips away. And everything. <laughs> oh. It was a nightmare. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, and I guess you know if it was just me. And uh, we didn't have a kid. I probably wouldn't have been so obsessive about. I'm like, ah, I got it for the most part. But he, oh, that's right where he plays. He yeah. plays out there barefoot, yeah. always. Yeah. And I've, I've trained here. And here's the other thing, I've trained him so well to be barefoot everywhere that like putting on, asking him to put his shoes on in our backyard is like blasphemy. Like yeah. dad, like I like never let him put his shoes on out in our backyard. It's like the worst oh, you, part of this is Katrina called it. Yeah, right? like, <laughs> yeah, oh, that, yeah. Is, that too. Hey, did you did she did, hey, did she rub it in? No, she, nice? she was good. She was because she knew cause she came out. She saw me. I had been, she's I was, just like I was drink, the, drinking her coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like, but you have a meme with it. <laughs> Weird, mm, having yeah. fun out here. If only if only we could have predicted. I mean, the crazy part is I. I mean, and I know how windy, but I mean, you're talking about a, it's not quite almost as big as this coffee table right here. And then a thick piece of glass. I mean, you're heavy. Yeah. It's not a light table. No, and, and pick that sucker up and. And they make that dang. glass, it's safety glass, because what they don't want it to do is to break and turn into long, sharp shards. So what happens right. if you break something like that? It Now, explodes. are you sure that's called safety glass? Because I thought safety glass is what's in our windshields, which it's spiders and it stays no, it's stuck called, together. Is it tempered? Is tempered, it tempered the right yeah. word? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a different name. It's designed to. To basically which turn it into a bunch to, to of pieces. To prevent what happened to my dad, which I didn't find this out till later on. He told me a story when he was uh, playing kickball, I believe, like when he was growing up, and he ended up like running through like a sliding glass door, oh. and it like almost got his artery. Yeah, like, oh, God. sliced all the way. Yeah. So through. I had I had a buddy that was we were playing in his backyard, and a rock hit his sliding glass door, and I remember it popped. It didn't like crack and break into yeah, the big whole pieces. Thing just it just went, Pfft. yeah, and that's what it. So what? It, it's tempered glass. Yeah, and, no, no, no. and it's stronger. But then what? What does it do when it shatters? And unlike, oh yeah, see it. It uh, fractures into small, relatively harmless pieces. Yeah, so they make it that way. To so do it's that. called tempered glass. Yeah, yeah. And I thought safe, it was safety, no, safety, safety glass thing. is what's on the windshield. Got which it. if you ever see a windshield break, it's spiders. Yeah, it has. Uh, it has like um, st it's like st sticky on both sides, so glass doesn't go anywhere. Like if you were to. I mean, shatter a windshield. It doesn't. The what about in the movies when they have a gun and they shoot through the windshield and stick their arm through? <laughs> like they make the hole and stick their arm through and start Is that <laughs> bullshit? Just, uh, I don't know. That's is Hollywood. That, you know what cracks me up? When people punch yeah, through, people punch through glass and windows and don't end up destroying their hand. Yeah. Or it's shredding like, everything. Yeah. They don't have like cuts everywhere. You know what would happen if you punch through glass with your hand? It wouldn't be very good for you. What does that say at? There. So these are all kinds of safety glasses, but the one Adam's talking about is laminated glass. Yeah. Oh. That's what's in the windshield. So it has like, you've ever seen it. it like it, the glass will all break, but it's all stuck together still because it's got like a Speaking a, of, a speaking of safety, because a lot of things are safer now, <coughs> did you know that there's one thing that is far more dangerous today than ever before? House fires. Did you know that in the past, it, so. took, it took like, I think like five times as long for a house to catch full flame than it does today. Why? Because of all the composite and plastics and 
all yeah, these these materials all the where chemicals. Yeah, maybe Duck could look this up. A house now, typical house now, if it catches fire, you got rid of asbestos, which actually was a great I, fire. I like, know. Yeah, it's like you have five deterrent. times less yeah. time to get out of the house yeah. before that shit. Is that why asbestos was so popular? I, oh, it's fire. Yes, oh, yeah. fire retardant. Blocked fire. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I actually didn't know that. Yeah. 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 I thought it was just some down. ugly ass style that we did in the seventies. No, 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 no. Oh, is that what was on the ceiling? The, the yeah. popcorn. Oh, yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. That's, that's that, was that asbestos? I think, yes, bro. I, I'm not sure if that's specific, but I know no, like, absolutely there was that some is. like no, a, yeah. absolutely it is. That's why like you have some, to get like yeah. you have to be all masked up if you scrape that shit off. Scrape it off. Yeah. Well, I don't. All I know is my cousin and I used to sit on his bunk bed and we'd make it snow by. So if I get this this explains so much. Oh <laughs> man, I, I know how smart I'd be right after to breathe that shit. We also ate paint chips. Yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, I mean, shit. I'll tell you what, dude. Uh, mixing chemicals and stuff again, working in construction. Yeah. I mean, they didn't wear shit. Like nothing. Oh, yeah. It was uh, just breathe it in, cough it out, blow your nose. What's in that? Oh, look, the paper's dark and I weird. Was, yeah, dude. I was on all kinds of construction. So I'm sure I was exposed to like all that crazy like chemicals. Oh, that man. What does that cancerous. say, Doug? That house is. Yeah, fire so fast. they burn faster because they are lighter weight and use cheaper materials. Mm. Oh, well, that That's makes nice. sense. Like <laughs> <laughs> a tinder box that sucks i saw yeah. what you know i've seen several times now this just happened again just like two days ago is those uh tiny houses are becoming more and more popular man really yeah, yeah. saw two of them on the freeway driving now, what, what makes a house a tiny molecule house? homes what ever? makes a house a tiny house yeah, it's like, tiny well i know that mm. but there's a lot of small houses like <laughs> really? what's the what where's the, the break oh, where, where does it where does something go from small to tiny yeah like what quality oh, that's what an, makes something a probably tiny under house? a thousand square feet so a, a tiny house, I think, for not, and not to say that you can't buy a regular house that's nine hundred square feet, but you're Doug. You're, d write that the Google app. Put like uh, what, what can, defines a tiny house, or okay. what is the criteria to make a tiny house? Because that's uh, it's got to be under a square trailer, a small It's got to be under a square footage. Yeah, because I, I would wonder that maybe under eight hundred. One of my friends from high school actually made a business out of it. I think he called it Molecule Homes, but it was like yeah. he was hoping it was going to take off. I wonder. Okay. They're huge it. now, dude. Yeah. Okay, so there's a distinction made between small houses, which is between 400 and 1,000 square feet, oh, and seems... tiny houses less than 400 square wow, feet. Wow, less than 400. What? With some as small as 80 square feet. Wow. Now these were feet? Now, these were yeah. things. No, thanks. That's an 8 by 10 room. That's your home. Now, hold on a second. This was a thing in, in, in Tokyo for a while, right? Don't they yeah, have like I think, pods or? Uh, yeah, they have pods. But I think those, those are just for overnight stay. Oh, but okay. I know in, I think it's Hong Kong oh. because they have the, I think they call them coffin homes and they literally oh. are about the size of a coffin. Oh they're God. super, super tiny little rooms and uh, I can't imagine living in one. You know, there's something, there would be, I can see obviously the negatives, but I could also see the positive. There would be something freeing. Oh my God. About yeah. living in, in like, so in bare minimum, right? No. Not, not with a family. <laughs> 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 I fucking, I'd be, I feel more like a prison cell. Uh, yeah, no. Have you seen though how they've innovated for some of these small spaces with uh, folding things out, making yes. them yeah, tables, yeah. like bringing the bed from the ceiling? Yeah. Like, you got to get real creative uh, in those like tiny settings. Yeah, it's like, it's I mean, I okay. So to back Sal up a little bit, even though I totally disagree. I mean, I I think it would be a value to go through a phase in your life as a minimalist. Yeah, right? minimalist mentality. Right. right, but I think you could also do that in your big giant house right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like I've thought, I've thought about this before. Like I look at my closet, which I clear out every year, and it just like blows me away how much. I mean, you of course, you don't we, clear out your closet. I do too. I clear my closet out all the time every year. I've seen your um, closet. And I go, you know, maybe this is the year where I'm going to pick, you know, I think there, there was a, there was a thing that went viral. I think it was, and then I think there was a book around it, uh, where you, you, you go down to 33 pieces of items. Yeah. I think something I like remember, that. I remember that number. Yeah. I right. Remember. Isn't that what it was? It was, it was like, something like that. It was like 33. It was like a specific number. Like this is it. Yeah. And so I thought like for like briefly for a moment, I thought about doing that. Like, okay, I'm going to, let's, can I, could I rotate? Cause when you think about it too, you kind of do stick to probably the same 15 to 20 outfits. Dude, my my, right? my grandfather would I tell like me stories. I cleaning house and like getting rid of stuff. I oh, love that. I, Jessica's really good liberating. I appreciate that about her. She'll do that every year. Like, yeah, a bunch I'm of all about that. My grandfather used to tell me, literally, this is my, my he passed away as my dad's dad, but he'd be like, he was talking about growing up with all his siblings and how they were poor. And he'd say, yeah, he goes, um, you'd wake up and you'd go and quickly grab the shoes or the pants because there's not enough for all you and your siblings. I'm like, yeah. what? He goes, yeah, if I if, if there were no shoes left, I'd have no shoes that day. Yeah. So you'd want to wake up first and go grab 
I'm like, what if they don't fit you? He goes, you, you make them fit. So you he would make them fit. He had one pair of shoes. He told me a story once that finally he got a pair of shoes that were his. Yeah. But they bought him hella big so that he could grow into them. Yeah. So first he wore big ass shoes, then his feet grew into them, and then they didn't fit anymore. So what did his mom do? Cut out the toes or something? Cut the toes out. <laughs> and now it's like sandals. Yeah. And this is what they did, bro. This is what wow. they did back then. Isn't this like uh, how you grew up is, would determine sort of like what setting you're going to create for yourself? Like of course. For, yeah, because for the way I grew up, like, so my mom is like like borderline hoarder. Like, would like just just acquire things, mm -hmm. you know, at like, and would be like a bargain hunter. And like, you know, uh, I, I was always getting like the secondhand stuff from my brothers. I was the youngest and this and that. And so it's like, I am all about minimal, like minimal things that are the nicest things things yeah. i don't want a lot of stuff but i want quality things yeah. i don't want secondhand shit anymore <laughs> you know like that's it like and it's and i and it, it's funny because she <laughs> you get into that that position where like she wants to like donate things to my house constantly and i'm always like thank you and then like you know you know my it. you know my mom they're they're okay about this i don't i wouldn't consider them hoarders they have a pretty clean neat house but 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 they were brought up obviously by their parents which were very poor yeah. right and so they kind of have some of that my mom will not throw away containers so here's what i mean by that you know how you buy food oh, yeah. that comes in a container katrina does this dude. like you, crazy? you buy cheese and it's in a container yeah. or you buy this and it's in a container she washes it and then that becomes yeah. a Tupperware. Yeah. Or so there's literally a cupboard <laughs> with containers I remember as a kid. <laughs> They're still there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we, we have I'll a drawer. Throw that shit away, dude. And like yeah, it's I play. So I uh, my I, when Katrina is getting Max ready for bed, I clean downstairs and part of cleaning is doing the dishes. My <laughs> one of the only fights or things I get frustrated with is when I have to like, let's say like we just made her her uh, pasta dish and there's always leftovers. And so I take the leftovers out and put it in Tupperware. But I refuse to do that because we have a, a Tupperware cabinet that is, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you guys sometime. It's fucking ridiculous. And it's because <laughs> she keeps every plastic thing that comes through. So if like yeah. we bought something at Safeway, you know, and it came in a plastic thing, it now That's becomes- a new Tupperware. It's new Tupperware. And so- I had bought, like, I think Doug actually got me one year, the glass ones, and I had a handful of ones that I like to use and stuff like that, and they were, like, all or in that. And now it's this, I mean, it is crazy, bro. I mean, we have thousands of things. And so I'll go under there, and I'll be so frustrated because I can never find the matching lid to the Oh, the you thing. got that, yeah. So I just, I, I just, I leave it. That's like, you know what? When it comes to Tupperware something, like, I'm leaving, I'll do everything else in the house. I'll do all Dude. the dishes, everything like that, but I'm leaving that I, on there because you got to go through your your Tupperware oh, deal. Oh, no, bro. My my parents have cups that I see. They were when I was a kid. <laughs> like and I AM, see, PM cups? Yes, dude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> my exactly. parents used to do that, too. And I yeah. see the cups. Although I, lo I used to uh, love those. And I, I love the old Burger King Star Wars ones. I stole those from bro, my parents. I, they, there were cups. I, I see the bite marks on them that I remember my brother putting on them. Oh, my God. When we were little. And I still, still got there. them? On there? Yeah. I'm wow. like, there's bite marks on this. Oh, it's still good. Yeah. Why would I throw it away? It's not good. <laughs> I go, oh, man. I hope I never eat my words. I was not an apocalypse. Can't like, be good thank for you. God. Yeah. 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 Drinking out of all of this old plastic. I know. Can't Doug. be healthy. I know. Yeah. What More things do? that explain why. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Between breathing and asbestos. And <laughs> <laughs> now I'm all about optimizing my health. Uh, and doing everything. <laughs> Speaking of optimizing, yeah. right? Uh, I read a study. So did you guys, so here's how big of an impact the temperature of your room has on your sleep. I didn't realize it was this big. It, there's an ideal range. And they say in the studies that it's around 67 degrees mm. and there's an individual variance. But 65. when you five, when you find your, your number, did you guys know that as little as a 0.7 degree change? So not one degree, a 0.7 degree change. They can measure in your sleep quality in your REM sleep that much. So if your ideal sleep temperature, let's say, is 65 degrees, 65.7, they can actually, with Who's studies, more sensitive to that, dads? Yeah, huh? probably. I 100% believe I can feel that. Just a 0.7. I got up last night and left. And because she was like, why did you leave last night? The room got warm. She was like, you literally left as soon as I closed the outside door. I felt it. Yeah. <laughs> I, felt I felt that half a degree, yeah. half a degree went up, dude. I was like, oh, it's going to be uncomfortable tonight. I'm out of here. Well, you know what? The, okay. So the challenge with this, and this is why, uh, obviously one of our partners is Chili and they make these, these for people that know, it's like a, it's like a pad that goes over your bed, under your sheets and it uses water to warm and cool. But what it isn't is a pad that you turn on and then it just stays hot or cold. What it does is it has the temperature gauge on it. You lay your body on it. Your body's hot. Yeah. It regulates itself to maintain that exact temperature. 
Right. So as you heat up, like it'll adjust. it'll it'll boost its cooling, right? Yeah. Or how if the temperature of the room changes, or if your spouse gets in, right. or whatever, it always maintains that particular temperature, which is why I think it's such a game changer. Right. Because before, I mean, even though I had it, like I like sixty five in terms of like the the outside environment, whatever. Now that I have the chili, is totally different. Like I can have that monitor specifically, but I would still wake up super hot if I had that freaking duvet on me or like, you know, Courtney <laughs> rolled over and like body heat or whatever. Like it would just like, I'd interrupt everything. Dude. So this is like, you know, control. Got an argument with, with Jessica the other night over the, over the, the sheets. Cause she kept pulling it and I had none. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so then I'd pull it back and then she'd roll and take it back. Yeah. And I'm like, and so finally it's like, you know, cause you're half asleep. So I'm like, this is bullshit. She's like, excuse me. I'm like, I have nothing. And I look, and it's because the, the sheets are half on the floor. So oh. she's got like a corner of it. But we were fighting. Do you guys over that not corner. do two separate blankets? No. Oh, we do. Really? So okay. So I ordered yeah. something for Katrina. She, you've been married so for longer than us. Maybe I need to do that. Can't stand Bro, I, okay. So I haven't opened it yet. I actually got it for Katrina for Christmas. Uh, you know, I I bought her a bunch. I, I do this right. Like I have like a couple of gifts that are like her nice gifts, and then I have a bunch of like random like stuff that I saw online. That, mm. Oh, this will great. I bought this blanket, and we actually have it, it unpacked. It. I totally forgot about it. Toward this conversation just happened. And it's 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 a blanket, but it has a split down the middle. What? So it's split, and is it I, attached at the bottom? Yeah, though? it's still attached to the oh, bottom. Okay, but it's it's so it's like it's split right down the middle. So you have like almost your <laughs> his and her sheets. Oh my! God. You know, I thought it was really brilliant. brilliant. You guys realized that. that it it wasn't until I want to say the '60s where it became commonplace that husbands and wives slept in the exact same bed. Before that, it was common yeah, to, to have two beds. Yeah. In the room. No, I like, yeah, I like combining. It's just, you know, it's just a, an age old battle. Yeah. I don't know. I, I have a weird thing about that. Like if I, I feel like. Would you know. be okay with that? Like who's more likely of all of us to have, it would be okay with. You know, I feel weird beds? not sleeping in the same bed or room as Jessica. It just doesn't feel right. But. I'm starting to warm up to it because I think that <laughs> <laughs> I feel well, like the I'm glad you're honest because I feel like if you said otherwise, I would say you're such yeah. a fucking liar. No, you come in here all the time complaining about. No, there's your something sleep. about there's something about it that makes me feel like oh that's not right. We're yeah. supposed to be together. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm like, is it really or is it just because I've been so the reason like, used to it? You know, too. that's what I'm yeah. saying. Maybe that's what the it only way it would work for me is if we both had, or at least for me, I had a, still had a king bed. I couldn't do a, a twin or a full. No, I'm not sleep in a twin. Oh, well, yeah, I'd love to see you twin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah one leg. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a small queen. I swear it was not like a full queen size, but we did that forever. And then when we made the jump to the king, it was like, this is what we should have been doing the whole time. I have my own land <laughs> yeah. over here, and you have yours. Yeah, no, I, I think maybe I, like my two favorite kings. part. One of my favorite parts about the chili is it keeps her over on her side. Oh, because the temperature. She likes it so warm, and mine's like ice cold. So she starts automatically. So she starts to creep over. It's like, oh my. God, it's so cold. So you roll back to the other side. I'm like, oh, this is another chili commercial. Yeah. I need to definitely <laughs> I need to talk about it's this. It's like an invisible fence. There, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's an invisible it should, fence. It should shock. I was going to say that make it electric shock. <laughs> That's uh, the next uh, upgrade. Hey, I want to tell you, Adam, because um, I know you you obviously have a bulldog and you had, you know, you, yeah. you had him for a while. Have you seen these these there's these articles that are come out talking about where there's like veterinarians and, and animal rights people saying we need to stop breeding pugs and bulldogs. Oh, they've been saying that for a long time. This is becoming Why? like a thing, though. Because the health issues and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just yeah. because they've been bred to look a particular way. Yeah. They're, they're saying it's animal cruelty, yeah. that we need to stop doing it. We need to stop breeding them because of all the breeding issues and all the health issues. Let's and, just stop making chihuahuas. Let's yeah. Stop well, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of torn, right? Because, like, what are you going to do? Not have that dog exist anymore? Like... Yeah, no, that's crazy. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I I don't know where I where I stand on. I, I'm like I'm not like this huge you know animal activist that I know that some I know some people like I I remember people were upset at me because I bought from a breeder and I didn't go to a, a rescue. Oh right. So a lot of people are just like they are. There's already so many bulldogs that are out there and it's already bad enough that they continue to breed them. Like why would you buy? So I remember when I first got the 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 boys. And I'd post about them. Like I, part of why I stopped posting about them, I was I'm fucking so tired of having to deal people slide in my DMs telling me what I should be doing and stuff. I'm like, oh my god. Have you ever seen pictures of what a lot of these breeds look like a hundred years ago? Like they look very different. Like English bulldog. You know what that used to look like? 
You ever seen what a American taller, bulldog looks yeah, like? It looks more like an yeah, American. You ever Ta- seen an American taller, bulldog? They had longer snouts too, so they could breathe better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They look very different. Yeah. Like an American bulldog looks more like what an English bulldog. Looks like. <clears throat> you can still see. So they so even they're, even um, they're called old English, right? So if you get an old English bulldog, they have the original traits. Oh, so okay. they're a little more rare to find, but then they they'll be taller and leaner, and then they'll have like a little bit longer snout. Yeah. yeah what's it, what's it called? The evolutionary like selective engineer like what's it called breeding yeah but like i mean in terms of any other species have we seen something evolve no. to like from wolf to no. to little tiny yapper dog no i watched a documentary on this apparently dogs have something special about their genetic makeup that allows them to change rapidly because we've domesticated other animals and they've changed but not to the degree. They're so we've done. radically Dude, different. Speaking oh, yeah. of wild dogs, so I was at the zoo this last weekend. Um, shout out to the Monterey Zoo, which is freaking. Didn't even um, know that existed. I didn't even know existed. Right up the street, beautiful, awesome spot. But you, I, uh, that was the closest I've ever been to a hyena. They're big. I know. They are much bigger than when, when you watch documentaries. That's because you yeah, see them next to a like lion. A dog. Yeah, yeah you see them next to lions, and they look so skinny. Well, a hyena and, will eat a dog for for yeah. lunch. Yeah, no they problem. are they are big, they're mean. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do we know they're mean and stuff like that? Big ass head. Yeah, but they don't. I mean, don't you think so? Like when you're watching documentaries, they look like they're kind of scrawny and skinny and just like they're small. I, I feel yeah. like they look small, yeah. but you don't ever see them compared to another dog. So or like that. Need to pick and something. to your point, yeah. you only see them next to like a lion, which is massive. But no, they're they're big. Yeah, yeah. I know. Seeing animals that you normally would never see, but seeing them in person, it changes your perception and, re- and just the relationship with them. Like I remember as a kid, I was probably ten. We went to a zoo. I think it was San Diego. They had a whole. They had a huge lion exhibit, and you could go at, during feeding time. Oh yeah. And you'd go in, and they would they would throw stakes at these lions, and the lions would roar and yeah. growl. It just vibrates like every cell in your body. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nuts. It's yeah. totally different being there in person and seeing them. Just you they're, hear they're that monsters, dude. guttural, yeah. like you know, vibrating and out of their mouth. And you're like, whoa, yeah. dude, that you really realize just how weak <laughs> we are. Like <laughs> that could eat me and like hang out with its friends at the same time and not even worry about it easily. It's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. Hey, I got something really cool for you. Check this out. So we work with a company called uh, Masszymes or Bioptimizers. One of the products is Masszymes. They make a lot of cool stuff. So my favorite product there is Masszymes. This is digestive enzymes for fitness enthusiasts. Why are this important? It helps you break down proteins, carbs, and fats. Helps with bloating. Helps you utilize all of your proteins so that they go to your muscles. You digest them properly. I use them with every meal. Love their products. Well, anyway, here's the cool part. You get a free bottle, okay? Just because you listen to Mind Pump. You can get a free bottle of Masszymes. All you got to do is pay a small shipping fee. That's it. There's no catch. You don't get this continu- uh, continuity thing going on where they charge your credit card. You just get the free bottle. That's how confident they are that you'll love their product. Try it out and see if it doesn't improve your digestion or your physique. It probably will. It did for me. So here's the deal. Here's how you do it. Go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash Mind pump free, and that's what you can do. By the way, it's only one free bottle per household. So don't take advantage of it in that way, but take advantage of the offer they're giving you. One free bottle. Go check it out. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First caller is Julio from Georgia. Julio, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Man, how are you guys doing? I'm excited to be here. Doing Doing good. good. Thanks for calling. Uh, I just want to let you guys know Obviously, I know everybody says, you know, thank you and I appreciate you guys, but, you know, I'm trying to be a personal trainer and it's definitely been a journey and I've definitely, you know, lost some motivation on the way, but ever since finding your guys' podcast, I am, I'm fired up, man. I'm excited. Excellent. Hell yeah. Definitely uh, seen in a different light. Very but cool. my first question, which I actually kind of feel bad about because I think you guys have answered this one a few weeks ago, but it's about you know how they always say you want to switch up your workouts. You want to get too stagnant. Um, my problem's kind of the opposite. Since I want to become a personal trainer, I kind of, kind of get too excited. I guess I see all these different workouts and I really just, you know, I, I go to the gym and I start doing all these different workouts every single day. And I don't really stay consistent in the aspect of the same exercise. And I was just wondering if that's, 
you know, in a sense, kind of hurting my gains. Um, Cause I guess they're, for an example, you know, I'll, biceps, you know, I'll be doing close grip. I'll be doing preacher curls, I'll be doing spider curls. I'll go and do the isolation machines and you the next week, it'll look completely different. So I was really just curious, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I'm going to answer this um, generally, and then I'm going to answer this for you uh, as an individual. So generally speaking- And then leave and, nothing for Justin and I. Nothing. Go I'm going to say <laughs> everything. All right, sounds leave, good. Leave Justin and I. <laughs> And uh, no, I'm I'll, I'll, that no, generally yourself. speaking, and you guys always have good, come on, shut up. Yeah. Uh, so here's the, uh, the general answer. Generally speaking, and this is, this is a, depending on the exercise, there's a skill acquisition period. And within that period of where you kind of, you need to gain the, enough skill or enough mastery of the skill of the exercise to really reap its benefits. And that can take some time. Okay. So a barbell squat, for example, is a high skill exercise in comparison to like a curl. So, you, you know, changing up your, your leg exercises all the time, you may not be able to really reap the benefits of the barbell squat because you're not allowing yourself enough of an opportunity to, to develop that skill. Okay. So that's general. And this is good for you as a trainer when you're training your clients, especially beginners or intermediate. Now, if you're super advanced, right. if you're really advanced and you've been working out for a long time, um, you know, you've been doing it for years then switching up exercises is less detrimental because you're, you, you have good skill, you have good movement quality, good mastery of your body. So you can go from one exercise to another and there isn't that huge, you know, kind of skill curve uh, when it, with the exercise. <laughs> so it's not, and it depends on the exercise. You talked about biceps, doesn't make that big of a difference. When you're talking about big compound complex lifts, it makes a, a, a much bigger difference. So, and then, okay. you, and then you got to consider this too. Like if this is what you love doing and this helps you stay consistent, that will outweigh the potential benefit of sticking to the same exercise. So if you enjoy doing it this way, then I'd say, you know, go for it. Yes and no, right? I mean, his you ended your question with, is it killing my gains? And my answer to you would be yes. This was me completely. Okay. All through my 20s as a trainer, uh, and it, you actually sound the way I would have explained it too. I, like, I loved, I loved, I used to take pride in actually telling people that I never did the same workout twice. Because I was, I would like to do all these creative workouts and different exercises, and I love challenging my body, and I was really fit. Um, but to Sal's point about the skill and getting better at a movement, especially when you talk about those compound lifts, there's so much benefit to practicing those same lifts over and getting better and better as far as building muscle. So my gains accelerated when I simplified my workout, when I stuck to mm -hmm. four or five of these major lifts and just kept practicing them and getting better. And that was later on in my life. So it wasn't like I was getting newbie gains. It was just that I was pra practicing the skill of these lifts that generated so much force and generated so much muscle on my body versus coming into every single workout and creating a, a new unique workout all the time. Now, if you came to me and you said, Adam, I'm already, I have all the muscle I want, I'm lean, I feel great, and I like to train this way, then I think there's like lots of benefit to training that way for staying healthy and fit. So I think there's lots of benefit to completely changing the routine up all the time. But if you're trying to make progress, strength gains, build more muscle, then I think you are losing out on that by constantly changing the routine up and not sticking to a routine more consistently and then letting your body adapt and then moving out of that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously you want to stick with the simple, uh, the, the biggest bang for your buck type exercise. The compound lifts are going to move the needle the most, but there's a way to still incorporate that novelty. And uh, this is something too, as a trainer, like you're going to be, in the gym setting quite a bit. You're going to be training yourself. You're going to be training your clients. You want to get them success. You want to get yourself uh, to keep going forward. But uh, to be able to also incorporate lifts uh, intermittently, uh, you know, whether it's off days or whether it's complementary towards, um, you know, whatever whatever body parts that you're working on for that day or, or whatever, like your focus is for that day. I tend to, to gravitate towards that just to make sure I keep things interesting because it is a long haul. This is, this is, this is thinking long-term um, mm -hmm. still moving the needle, but right. also like, yeah, you can, you can still get that kind of stimulus you're looking for. Cause I'm the same way. Like I, I need like some creativity. I need something like a little bit different for me to focus on that way. It keeps it interesting. Yeah. And, and Julio, this can all, this can also go to extreme in the other direction, right? If all you ever do are these, you know, gross motor movements, um, eventually you can develop imbalances. Yeah. 
You're not training in different different planes. You're not uh, maybe maybe you're building a lot of strength in a specific type of range of motion, not challenging other ranges of motion. So this can be extreme in either direction. Um, now you're becoming a trainer, or you are a trainer. When you train clients, like with beginners, it's really important you stay consistent with certain key exercises because one of the 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 follies that trainers fall into. Um, is always trying to wow your client with a new, exciting, different workout. And that's the value you try and provide. Oh, today's workout, you've never seen these exercises before, and here's a new movement, and right. this is something different. And then the person the never- on the experience. Yeah, and so really the value from, from, from the workout is kind of a calorie burn, and not really, the client never really gets good at specific exercises enough to really reap uh, the benefit. So I like to pick- certain core lifts, get the client good at those core lifts. And then I'll use novelty as a way to supplement and to enhance those. So if I notice, you know, this person's doing squats and I notice uh, we need more lateral stability, well, I'll throw them a little variety, maybe doing some lateral sled, you know, dra drags or some tube walks or something like that. You know, if I notice in their overhead press, uh, maybe the extension is a little bit of an issue. I might do some overhead carries um, or some stabilization exercise for the shoulder. So so it's it's going too extreme in either direction has its issues, um, but of course at the end of the day also you're doing this for life. So if you enjoy the variety uh, so much that that's what really makes you consistent, what you look forward to, well don't don't swap that out for something you're going to hate. You know, is that, is that something else you want to consider? Julio, right. you, have you? No, I, I definitely just don't want it to affect you know how I train people. You know, so it makes sense. Absolutely, Julio, have you or have you ran any of the maps programs? I actually, I, I remember there was a girl, she was uh, trying to be a personal trainer to her. She was, and she went on the podcast and you kind of <laughs> tore into her for not buying it. So he's like, I don't want to get lit up. I am going to fucking shame it's you gross. right now. Two and a half years. You've been fucking listening to us talk and you haven't bought maps performance or maps prime pro or maps prime yet. And you're a trainer. Shame on yeah. you. Shame on you. Seriously. That's the first thing I did, man. <laughs> oh, 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 number two. Adam scared Smart. you. To buy <laughs> I got a lot of you heat. Save, you save the I got a lot of heat for that one, bro. Oh, nah. man. I got I to gotta, I gotta be nicer to the trainers. I mean, some of these trainers get a little sensitive today. No, I can't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. It's it's you got to yell at them, man. It works. Uh, I, I got hey, the anabolic thank and you. the prize. Thank you, Julio. So it's, it's only because, yeah, he, only because he loves it's them. love. Yeah. Well, it's the, love. And, no, the reason why I was asking was because you can you can get kind of an idea on the way we program in there and how we introduce novelty so you're not just literally following the same five exercises all the oh, time yeah. but then also phasing it in a way that you do stick to certain exercises for at yeah. least a three or yeah. four week period before you, see you that phase formula out. you see that we keep repeating certain patterns for a reason yeah uh, but yeah the, it does right. provide that stimulus too. Yeah. the novel stimulus that was the main reason i was asking you but <laughs> i'm glad i'm glad yeah, you, i'm glad you <laughs> took the advice before yeah. awesome bro and it, it looks like you had a, uh, another question about creatine yeah. So, you know, I just seen the directions for creatine. I, I just kind of started taking it. It's been about, you know, maybe a few months, but it doesn't say, you know, when to stop, when to take a break. It just kind of says take a scoop every day, five grams. So I just really wasn't sure, you know, if there's a point where I should be taking a break. If yeah. I should be, you know, taking while I'm trying to cut. You know, had, had you asked me that question uh, 10 years ago, I would have said probably a good idea to cycle off of it. Now I don't think so. Okay. Like the, the creatine is really fascinating. It's it, obviously it was originally marketed as a strength and muscle building supplement. It's really good at that, but now we're learning that it's probably more valuable for health than it is for for strength and muscle growth. It's phenomenal for mitochondrial health. Uh, there's cognitive benefits, uh, heart health. Um, so uh, I think now, of course, there's there's going to be cases where. You might not want to supplement with creatine, um, you know, maybe if it causes gut issues or if you have a nephrologist, you know, if you have kidney issues, that might be something. But otherwise, I think everybody would benefit from supplementing with creatine um, and at varying degrees, right? So if you have more muscle, you probably take more. If you have less muscle, take less. If you eat more meat, then you need less than somebody who's maybe a vegan. But yeah, okay. no, there's, there's no reason to go off. And if, if anything, it's it's uh, the, all the evidence now, and it's been studied a lot. So we're looking at the, over the last, God, uh, <laughs> at least 25 years, thousand, you know, thousand or more really well done studies on creatine. It's the most studied ergogenic supplement there is. 
and the positives are insane in, in just in health. And we're going to see now the health community, you're going to start seeing wellness people promoting creatine, not bodybuilders, not people trying to tell you to build muscle, burn body fat, but people who are like, this will improve your health. This is good for longevity and all that stuff. So speaking of that, Julio, are you, uh, are you on Facebook at all? Julio? Oh, he just froze. Oh, can you hear me though? I don't know. I don't think so. Do the sign language to him, Doug. I can't see him. He's frozen. Uh, oh, he can't see you at all. Let's all take a moment of silence. Yeah. Write, him, write him a letter. Yeah, yeah I, I'm afraid we may have lost him. Right. Well, Julio, well, if you listen to this episode oh, yeah, afterwards, this um, I think Adam wanted to let you in our forum. Is that where you were? Uh, no, I would. Well, yeah, we could let him in the private forum, but I was actually going to bring up the uh, the Mind Pump Holistic Health Forum, which we just launched, which is free to the audience. Oh, and, good idea. Yeah, that's MP Holistic Health. Yeah, MP yes. Holistic Health. We just On started Facebook. it with Dr. Cabral, they, him and his team are going to be there on a weekly basis. If you are a personal trainer, okay, here, this will be the next thing that I harp on trainers about. Okay. This is more free, valuable content. So that, valuable that we go out and we, we build as a service for you guys to support our community. If you are a trainer, you should be in that forum. The amount of knowledge and wisdom that you're going to get from that forum to help with your clients is unbelievable. It's absolutely free. It's on Facebook MP holistic health and uh, your clients Send your clients yeah, there. I talk yes. about this all the time. The troubleshooting is one of the, the amazing. Thing. Oh, the most one of the most effective things I did as a trainer was develop a network mm -hmm. of other professionals who were not trainers, people in uh, other uh, fields. And you send your clients there, and they get that holistic wellness information from the best in the industry. We picked Dr. Cabral and his team for a reason. There's some of the best that are out there. Um, you send your clients over there, and the value they're going to get is going to be tremendous. It's really going to benefit you as a trainer because you'll be able to present that value to your clients. All right. So, um, uh, you, you know, this whole, this whole variety, I need tons of variety in my workouts. I think fitness media marketing has done people a disservice by, you know, promoting things like muscle confusion and yeah. kind of preying on people's, uh, like that, that crazy weird workouts are fun and that's yeah. what's valuable about them. Well, don't you think too, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things like who can come up with the new thing that, uh, yes. it sparks everybody's curiosity and motivation and can kind of, uh, you know, get that market share. And so it's like, the, there's been all these competing ideas for a reason to be different, uh, which is convoluted the whole process. Somewhat. Yeah. When you're a trainer, I think there's a couple of things working here. Uh, one, to your point about the muscle confusion, I think that was one of the reasons why I, I thought that that was a good strategy to design my programs. The second thing, being honest too, was I knew that uh, in my gym, the, the members knew I was a trainer. And so I intentionally did random creative shit all the time to get attention. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, there's not a bad strategy. It by works. The way. Yeah. It does. It did work. You know, many times I'd be doing some different unique exercise and a member would ask me, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you doing that? And then it opened the door for me to book an assessment or an appointment with them. So it was great for generating leads. And so it was really easy for me to kind of fall into that where, so, so, there's nothing wrong with training this way. I mean, I was in very good shape. Um, I do want to add, though, that because you were a trainer, because you had an athletic background, you had at least enough mastery of your body to gain benefit from such variety. You know, imagine putting a beginner on a different exercise all the time. No, I mean, I'm thinking as a trainer, right? Because we're yeah. talking, we were talking to, he's a trainer, yes. right? So I imagine that you know, we would hope, right? If you're a trainer, you have a, the desire yeah. to have really good technique and form and you're into some lifting. Some experience, yeah. Yes, and some experience. And so... I, I'm, I'm envisioning a, a very similar, you know, version of myself in my 20s that was training this way all the time. And, you know, you can be really fit. But it, what I heard from him as he asked the question was, you know, is it killing my gains? Yeah. And it was killing my gains. Like, it's because it, at that time, even though I was doing all those things, if you were to ask me, yo, man, what's your goal? I'd be like, oh, I want to get bigger. You know, I want to get bigger, more muscle. I want to get stronger. But yet I was training that way. And so it was hindering that. It was, even if I was slowly progressing in that direction, um, by simply ignoring, because I was missing the overhead press, I was missing the deadlift, I was missing the squat. There's no specificity of, yeah. of a goal. There was none of that going on. And if I did do any of those three movements, it was sporadically. You know, oh, I haven't deadlifted in months, so I'm going to deadlift this workout, and then I wouldn't return to it forever. Oh, I haven't squatted forever, so I'd squat this one workout, then not return yeah. to it forever. Like, So I think that that is what was killing my gains. And if he's somebody who's changing his routine up that much, 
then and he's missing out on those those big five core lifts uh, uh it can being consistent with them then absolutely he's missing out totally on some I, some of the I, I'm so lucky as a kid to have those older power lifters advise me as a teenager and they said to me and I'll never forget this because they're like what's your goal I'm like I want to get big like well uh if you could squat 400 pounds you're gonna have big legs if you could bench 300 pounds you're going to have big shoulders, arms, and chest. And I remember, and if you could deadlift 500 pounds, you're going to have a big back. And I remember like just focusing, like thinking like, that's it right there. It was the best advice I could ever have. So our next caller is TJ from Utah. TJ, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, how's it, how's it going? Good. Good. Hey, thanks for taking my, uh, my question. Um, First, I had to laugh when Justin was talking about his visit to Salt Lake recently <laughs> and uh, all that he went through. I thought it was kind of funny. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just a little background. I'm 41 years old, 5'11". Growing up, I was involved in sports, um, mainly baseball and wrestling, and uh, became a, a state champion, a wrestling champion my senior year. Uh, the next 20 years, I kind of bounced in and out of the gym, probably going, oh, three to six months and then taking a few years uh, break. Uh, sometimes I get into running, ran a marathon once, which wasn't actually really fun for me. And then um, when I turned 40, that's when I started to think about life and, and I thought, what could I give myself? And so I thought I'm going to give myself the gift of life. So I started, I joined the gym, started to learn a lot about nutrition, uh, macros and strength training, found you guys and uh, your podcast and YouTube channel has been really helpful. I did that. Uh, I made some, some progress, but there, I didn't, I had a goal, but not a specific goal. Then this year, uh, beginning in January, I joined a 90 day challenge. And so from those 90 days, I, my weight started at 185 and I got down to 158. Um, I was tracking my calories. I was about 1700 calories a day, walked 45 minutes a day, and then, uh, ran maps anabolic. And so my question now is I'm at this lean state, but I want more muscle and I'm just trying to figure out how, how can I competently bulk without ruining all the progress all that right. I've, that I've done. You're in a great position. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, are you still doing 45 minutes a day of cardio? Or he's just walking. No, I do. No, I cut that back. I, I do walk about, I walk 30 minutes, three times a week. Okay. Yeah. yeah it was just a question because uh, the first thing I would have done is have you reduce that, but how do you bulk without gaining body fat? You just do it slowly and and you'll find it's going to go to muscle if you do so. So if you're really, if, if you're really apprehensive, um, you could just bump your calories by two or 300 and wait and see how that feels. And then once you feel confident with that, then you move up another two or 300. The issue with bulking tends to happen when people swing so far from one end to the other. So yeah. they go, I'm, you know, I'm at 1600 calories and then they go crazy with the bulk. And it, it, what happens with that, and I just want to let you know if this happens to you, is if you swing from 1,600 calories to 2,600 calories or 3,000 calories, for the first like three weeks, you're not going to gain body fat. You're just going to feel strong and muscles going to come in. You, you'll get fooled into feeling like you just eat whatever you want. And that's when people run into yeah. a problem. So just do it slowly. Really, that's it. Just Just start slow. Be patient. Watch how you feel. Watch your strength. Watch how your body looks. Um, and if anything, you'll just gain muscle. You might actually find yourself get a little leaner through the process. Yeah, no, you're in a great place right now. 158, 511. I'm, I'm picturing you pretty damn lean. So you're pretty lean right now and only walking a few times a week, following anabolic, eating around 1,600, 1,800 calories. I'd move you to 2,000 calories and I'd switch your program and, I, I j and then just stick to that for a while. And see how see how the weight comes on. And if you don't, what might happen because of the new the new stimulus, like Sal saying, you may actually lean out, and you might not see the scale go up that fast. You know, and then creep it up to twenty two hundred calories. But w watch it for a couple weeks um, by changing the the routine up and adding the couple hundred extra calories. Um, and I think you should put on some good lean mass. Yeah, TJ. What doesn't happen is you eat more calories and then you wake up tomorrow. 
<laughs> and you gain 30 pounds of body fat. Okay. So the fear that you have, I get it because I had the opposite fear because I was, I was skinny and wanted to gain weight. So I was afraid if I fasted or if I missed a meal, oh my God, I'm going to lose all this muscle overnight. It happens slower than that. Okay. It's a process. So the, the fear you're having is probably because you, you, you dealt with being overweight for a little while and you're like, I don't want to go back to that anymore. Um, yeah, don't worry about that. If you go slow through this process, you're going to be totally fine. And the, and you'll, and like I said, you're, like we're both saying here, you, you may actually find yourself get a little leaner as you build muscle because you're, it's going to go to muscle. And if your body weight goes up five pounds, but it's all muscle, your body fat percentage actually goes down. So, um, so that's really, that's the key. 200 calorie, 300 calorie bump, hold it there until you feel confident and then try it again. Really that's key with all of this is to, to take a slow methodical approach add a few hundred calories, wait, see what happens. Switches programming. That was the other thing I said. Yeah, 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 there you go. So I said 2,000 calories, switch your programming to be more specific. Yeah. So, is, it, is it MAPS? Um, you're doing MAPS anabolic. Do you have MAPS performance? That would be a great follow-up. Yeah, um, yeah I just did uh, phase one of performance. Yeah. Oh. So I just actually started phase two this Perfect. week. Stay the course. You're, you're, on, you're on track, TJ. You're doing yeah. good. Just, just, make so, it, just do it slow. Yeah, trust the process, man. Can I ask a, a MAPS general question? Sure. Sure. Um, so when you outline specific workouts, how important is it to do those workouts in order and that specific workout? For example, sometimes with anabolic, there would be a bench press and I go to the bench and it's full. So I thought, well, I don't really want to wait. So I'm going to just go to the next exercise and see if it's, um, see if it's available. And if it's not, I'll just go to the next exercise. And then when it's available, I'd go back. Or sometimes I would just go up. Oh, I'm going to do dumbbell dumbbell press instead of bench today. Is there any benefits? Or it's only really important. The order of the exercises where it becomes really important is if that is an area that you are trying to focus on. So, for example, like we normally lead a lot of workouts with like squats or deadlifts, right? right. So, if that's a, an area of focus for you, like maybe you think you have weak legs and you want stronger, bigger legs, and you go to bench press first, that's what will hinder you. But if you maybe your goal is to build a bigger chest and starting, so whatever exercise you prioritize first, mm. you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck for. Yeah, that and also too just to eliminate some of the fatigue for some of those compound lifts that's why we start off with them so you're okay. able to perform at uh you know the highest level so mm -hmm. but again you got to consider if it's a really busy gym and it's not available and you're not trying to waste time so that's you know something to consider where you just have to play that out for yourself yeah. but it's not like detrimental it ain't killing you yeah it's not killing it depends how much you how much you mix yeah. it up but uh, you know and i like your second option better rather than going you know, skipping bench and doing shoulders first or something like that, you could go to dumbbells. I like that option better, to be honest with you. So okay. it'd be better to substitute yeah. the exercise with something similar than it would be to, to, to mix up the order. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense for the compound uh, lifts. I actually never thought about how you do those first because it takes more energy, but yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. You, got, you got it, TJ. Thanks, man. Thanks for calling in. All right. Well, I appreciate all the guys do. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, brother. Right, Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll see you. Yeah, the 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 fear of gaining body fat in a surplus and the fear of losing tons of muscle in a deficit oh, really very common. It's super common when that's your insecurity. Yeah. Really hard to do. Like talking somebody who's dealt with obesity forever that, hey, you know, we're gonna bump your calories. Oh, it's like it's well, scary. when they spent all that time working on reducing weight and body fat and that was their entire focus to now completely shift in the other direction yes a big psychological jump truth is though he's got a ton of flexibility here yeah. i mean oh, we, yeah. gave, we gave a very conservative like hey oh, add really good two or three hundred calories but i tell you what if he's following maps programming which he is and he's and he's switching it up and he's as lean as he is right now so long as he's making good food choices, he could probably even get away with eating more than that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like he's, he's probably not going to gain the much. Yeah, any extra calories is probably going to get partitioned over to helping him build muscle. I mean, so long, I mean, I wouldn't recommend eating over over a thousand calories, but I bet he could get away with probably eating up to that Yeah, and mm -hmm. probably be fine. And definitely if he's eating yeah. around two or 300 in a surplus, because what I think will happen is if he just adds 2,000, 
two or three weeks may go by and he might get leaner to your yep, point. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's he why might, I said that. I, I'm really playing to psychology, right. you know, because I know that it's like a bigger leap, right? To, yeah. to go on the other. I mean, this is why fasting was for me so, such a, um, I mean, it just really transformed how I viewed things because I was so afraid mm -hmm. of skipping a single meal or being an hour late when I was supposed to eat that I skipped a whole day of eating. You said you're going to shrink. And I, yeah. And I was like, I felt like uh, the doors had opened to so many other opportunities and, and things. So, um, so yeah, you got to play to that a little bit. I think our next caller is Jerome from Nevada. Jerome, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, doing good. Uh, I appreciate you uh, taking my call. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I have your, I've purchased your anabolic performance aesthetics, power lift and strength. And um, right now I'm in the middle of performance, but um, sometimes in the public gym, uh, when it's back, uh, it's kind of hard to do them in sequence. So I was wondering if you, if there's, if it's going to affect uh, the program, if I don't do them in sequence and also um, are there any alternatives for particular exercises? Like for example, if the, if the gym is packed, um, I can't do, uh, for example, cable flags. Is there, a, is there a way or is there a way in your program that I could do alternative uh, exercises besides, uh, for example, cable flies versus tumble flags? Yeah, similar to a, similar to a previous question. But um, all right, so here's the deal. What makes a workout program a program is the exercises, the reps, the sets, the sequence of the exercises, the sequence of the days in the workout, the sequence of the phases in the workout, and so on. All of that is part of the formula. So if you, it, it would be like if you were asking me, hey, how important is the reps that you prescribe or how important are the sets that you prescribe? I mean, it's all important, right? So the sequence is pretty important. Now, now we got, now here's the problem though. We got to be pragmatic. You're in a gym, it's not available. Okay, what do I do now? Because I don't have time to sit around and wait for, you know, the five dudes looking at their phone on the bench press to, to, to finish doing the thing. So how, what do I do? The next best thing is to do a similar exercise and the more similar, the better. So cable fly to dumbbell fly. I like that cable fly to lunges. I don't like that. You see what I'm saying? So if it's yeah. similar to the exercise, that's uh, much better than if it's a completely different I exercise. would even say cable fly to like a pec deck or a machine like that sure. would be even okay. Sure. Or even a band fly, rubber, grab a rubber band and wrap it around a pole and do flies like that. It's, it's more similar than the, the dumbbell fly because we probably right. have dumbbell flies programmed yeah. in that routine somewhere, right? So. Yeah, I think I mean you have to you have to be able to call an audible in a public gym during prime time, right? I mean it's yeah. just it is what it is. Sometimes you're not going to be able. We just Sal, Sal was talking about a guy we just talked to, and we were talking about the order of the exercises, and there we put them in an order for a reason. So if if it's you're supposed to start off with squats, you're supposed to start off with squats. Does that mean if the squat machines or the squat racks are all taken and you have to start with bench, it's going to ruin the program? No, it's not going to ruin it. It's just ideally we want to try and follow it as closely as possible, but we also recognize that there's times where you've got to call an audible like that, and so you have to do a, a different exercise, but you want to choose exercises that are as as closely related to the one that's programmed in there as possible. And worst case scenario, just alpha everybody out of your way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's always an option. You know, here's the other thing too, Jerome. How long have you been working out in gyms for? Um, I started last year, but I found your program um, a few months ago. Um, and then I, I, I loved it because uh, I, had, I saw – tremendous improvements in my physique. Okay. So, uh, and now I, that's why I, I kind of got to all your programs. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. They work for Almost sure. Almost all of your programs. Yeah, they definitely work for sure. But okay, so a lot of people don't understand um, gym etiquette, especially if you haven't been in a gym for a long period of time. It is totally reasonable and it is the rule of the gym, okay? And, and believe me, the manager of the gym, the employees will back you up. If somebody's doing an exercise and you want to do that exercise, it is totally reasonable to walk up to that person and say, hey, while you're resting, can I please jump in? Mm -hmm. Totally reasonable. And I, I do it all the time. Now, yeah. if somebody says no, totally fine. If you want to be a dick, you can ask the manager. And I, I look, I managed gyms for years. And when people didn't let other people jump in, I would defend the person that wants to jump in. That's just, that's just gym etiquette. So if it's like a 
a big key exercise, like a squat. And there's a guy in there doing squats and he's taking his sweet time. And you're like, man, I want to just, Hey, can I, let me jump in with you while you're resting. Can I work in? That's it. And usually they'll say yes, especially if they're experienced, they'll Mm -hmm. say yes. I did not know that, that there's a, that type of etiquette. Yeah. 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 A lot of people don't know that, but it it definitely is. It's a a gym law and and (laughs) not only will the manager support you, (laughs) but so will every experienced person in that gym. So, and if he doesn't (laughs) take a picture of him and then send to us and we'll put him on blast in the podcast. Now, okay. (laughs) I'm going to add one more thing. It's your responsibility. If you're asking someone to jump in to change the weight and put it back to what it was when it's their turn. Now, if they're a nice person, they'll help you. But if you're jumping in my set, I don't expect me to help you unrack and rack it. I'll, I'll probably help you. But that's the job of the person jumping in. So that's the other part I forgot to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. you I appreciate it. that. No problem, man. Thanks for calling in. Thank you very, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank Me you. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I forget that people don't really. No, yeah, I'm, so gl- I'm actually point, so glad you you <laughs> actually even thought to, to, to mention that. I mean, it's been a while, actually, since we did. We did an episode on gym etiquette a long time ago. A long ago. time ago. But uh, I forget, you know, you get somebody who is... We haven't been in a commercial gym setting. Forever. Yeah, but you get somebody who's relatively new to lifting, and Sal's right. It's such a it's a, such a great point that we maybe don't communicate enough on, on the podcast that, yeah, it's it's very much so gym etiquette to mm-hmm. ask somebody, hey, can I work in? And, and then, especially if they're doing like you're saying, because that's normally... You know, most people are training three to five sets, right? Five on yeah. the high end. Most people are, th- you know, three to five range and should be done in a couple minutes mm-hmm. with their the the machine or exercise or bench you're using. And if they're not because they're they're talking or on their phone, they should not have a problem with you walking over and say, hey, can I work in real quick? Yep. And allow yeah, you target to the one that's like uh, on their phone messing around the longest. You yeah, know? It's yeah. like, hey, let me jump in here. Yeah, yeah. it's not it's not a big deal. I don't give a sh- I don't care when someone asks me to jump in. But no. it is, but here's the deal, though. Again, yeah, I want to do have to re-rack the weight. You, yeah, you go you go in, you take the weights off if you need to or add the weights and go to set it back to how they were using it before since they were the original one using it. And some exercises just don't work well, like. If someone t- wants to jump into my deadlift and I got five plates on and they're going to go down to one, like as long <laughs> yeah. as you can r- unrack it and rack it by the time it's my turn, we're not going to have an issue. But you know, with deadlifts, a little harder. Just don't be the guy that sets up a circuit in busy hours. I will slap. Ah, uh, yeah. And if people take your exercise because you're in a circuit, well, then that's the problem. And fine, you got to deal with it. Well, that's normally the guy who's blocking this guy. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Normally, yeah. someone like this, who's the new guy, doesn't know that, and sees like, oh man, this guy's using the bench, the fucking squat rack, and yeah. this, and he's like, what do I do? You know what I'm saying? Like, but that asshole needs to get out of the way. It's not yeah. you. Totally yeah, move him out. Our next caller is Chet from Oklahoma. Chet, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys. Uh- I just have a quick question here. Um, I'm going to keep the background short. So in the last two years, I've gotten a lot of questions from peers and sometimes strangers, how they can stay in shape as we get older. I'm currently 36 and I've been exercising and weight training for about 15 years on and off. Um, the last four years I found you guys and it's helped quite a bit. So um, my current answer to anyone that asked right now is to binge listen to the podcast and buy into everything you guys say and trust the process. It seems not to be working too, too well. It's a little bit of an information overload. It seems to be and they complicate it a lot more than it needs to be. So my question is, since I'm not educated in this space, should I be giving any fitness advice to other people at all based on my past experiences? If so, how do I go about doing so without giving the wrong advice? Oh, what a great question and a very (laughs) thoughtful one, Chet. I appreciate you saying that. So you've been working out for a long time. You've got a lot of accrued wisdom um, that most people don't have. Now, you haven't trained lots of people, so that's kind of where you you may go wrong. But you got four years of listening to the podcast. Yeah, though, too. And I, I mean, really, okay, here's, here's where you're probably, if you're going to say anything wrong, here's what it'll probably be. You might tell someone to go harder than they should, or you might give someone too much volume or too many exercises. This is where the mistake people often make when they have been training themselves for a long time and they talk to someone who's, just getting started. In fact, this is a, a mistake most trainers make. It took me a while to figure this out. I would get a new client. I mean, literally, like I could get someone who's deconditioned and we would do a set of standing squats and that was it. That was plenty for the lower body. I would have never thought that was plenty in my first couple of years as a trainer. I would have thought we had to do more exercise. So that might be it. And I would stay away from like pain relief advice or correctional exercise type stuff. But general advice... <laughs> 
I think you're they're going to be better off, you know, asking you than than going on the internet and just kind of searching randomly unless they find our podcast in which case they'll, they'll probably get great advice we also have uh a thing called 30 days of free coaching on the website we don't promote it or talk about it very okay. much anymore um we created it a long time ago it's due for a revamp we should uh, we've talked about actually improving it but i mean i think it's still extremely valuable we still have hundreds of people that go through it every single month and it's absolutely free and it's basically an email sequence uh, over the course of 30 days, we basically email drip people little bite-sized information. So for example, like I think day one is like protein is the topic. And it's literally the size of like one short email of just some really basic good information around protein. And then it has links to shows where we t speak in detail about that. So if it's like a topic, they're like, like for example, one of the days is gut health. And so maybe one of your friends is is struggling with something that or wants more information with that, they can go and actually listen to the podcast versus just the little bite size information. I think that's a really good place to start. That's not as because obviously telling people to go listen to our podcast that's got eighteen hundred episodes is probably overwhelming yeah. for a lot of people. But signing up for a free email drip that get, goes to them and it's a, a short, you know, five minute or less read every day and they can choose to go deeper and listen to the podcast episodes yeah. that are linked to it or not. I think that's a really good place uh, to start people. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, as back to Sal's advice there and um, telling them to go a little too hard, I think I got that down under control since I made those mistakes already. Mm. And so I have written down, you're like, that's one of my biggest fears, I guess, is sending like a good friend of mine to a personal trainer who doesn't listen to you guys first of all and uh gives them the wrong advice like i'm experiencing that right now with one of my close friends is they got got him on the extra heavy exercise and low calorie diet already so it's hard to uh talk them out of it yeah that's a tough one um you know i don't want to generalize but usually experienced trainers or trainers who've been doing it for more than five years are better off um, than the new trainers. Now this isn't always true. Okay. But it, it, it's more often than not true just because if you've been training people for five years and it's your profession, this is what you do for a living, not part-time or whatever, you have to figure this out because, uh, you won't, you won't yeah. last that long if you don't. So that's where I, t that's what I tell people like, yeah, make sure that they've got, you know, the education, make sure this is what they do for a living and then see if you can find someone who's experienced, who's been doing this for a long time. Experience in training people in real life, too, not yeah. a fitness yeah. influencers who's, who's been, been, who's been selling yeah. programs or portals for the last five or 10 years because there's a big difference there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. that's good. Thank you, Chet. And by the way, do you have here's another okay, you know what a great place to start would be for a beginner? Uh, my book, The Resistance Training Revolution. It, I wrote it specifically. Oh, we got, we for got her. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that, that would be the place yeah. to start because I'm that's what I'm talking. That's really who I'm talking to um, in that book and in okay. the workouts in there too are really appropriate for a lot of people just getting started. Shameless book plug. <laughs> Works. You get paid. <laughs> on, thanks. You get paid on it too, Adam. <laughs> 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 thanks for calling, man. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, that you know, um, you could tell he's been doing it for a long time because of how he asked that question. Yeah, you know somebody's been working out for two years. Oh, I can I'll tell you what to do, mm -hmm. but he's been doing it long enough to be like, okay, like I, you know, I want to be careful to yeah. give, give the right advice because I've been doing this a long time and there's a lot of pitfalls. You know, it is tough to kind of organize your thoughts in that direction sometimes when you just have all of this experience in like so many different directions you can point people to to be able to simplify it. It really does require a lot of time and skill to like condense it down to like the here's your very first step dude so true like how many times in your early days when you're helping someone they're like justin i need help oh no i want to like, lose weight oh you're God, like let me think about this yeah, here's your diet <laughs> yeah. here's your workout here's your cardio here's your sleep schedule here's the supplements and so you give them like <laughs> all this stuff and they're like yeah wow whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah you know? like you know three things exactly yeah. well it's so nuanced you can have somebody the same age same goal same experience and I could off the top of my head think of five, 10, 15 different recommendations potentially based off of the information you receive yep. from them. Yeah. Yep. You, you need know? all that info to, to yeah. move forward. So it's it's not as simple as, oh, this is a new beginner, there therefore point them this way. Oh, this is a yep. person who's, who's moderately experienced, therefore point them this way. It's like there's such an individual variance with with especially with with diet, including diet into that conversation. Oh boy, diet's a whole nother monster. Well, yeah, and, and that has to be considered, right? Because if it, you know, 
if someone has got, uh, you know, like let's say gut issues, like we were talking about, uh, how you're going to train them really matters too. Like, I don't want that person to be training overly yeah. intense and even if they have lots of experience. Right. So yeah, no, it's, and just because you've been lifting for 15 years, uh, yeah, that qualifies you as far as taking care of yourself. Cause you've probably fallen in those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. You figured it out yourself, but recommending to other people is tough. And then I get, you know, Hey, go listen to mind pub. Oh, okay. 1800 episodes. <laughs> <I know. laughs> like, Whoa, yeah. Fuck off guy. I have a life, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, but that's why we did the 30 days of coaching. I know we don't, we don't talk about it very much on oh, the show. That's a great recommendation. Yeah. But it's, I mean, that was the, the vision for that. When we first started the podcast was when we st first started getting this, these kind of nuanced questions. It's like, to me, going through that, I think is a, is a really good place to start somebody who's like a absolutely no idea where to go. Hey, look, if you love our show, you got to go to mindpumpfree.com. We have tons of free guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us on social media. So you can find Justin on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can only find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.com.